Uh, okay, so to, to the task at hand, so this semester, uh, all of the speakers that are coming to speak with us, to speak with you, um, I've asked them to focus on this idea of engagement. So how do we as citizens engage with environmental issues globally, nationally, and just right here in our communities? And so we are going to look at this idea of engagement from a whole bunch of different perspectives. So people who think about it for different disciplines, people who think about it at different levels, so international conservation versus local environmental justice. Um, to kick things off, we have what I, I think will be a really cool and neat perspective on engaging in conservation issues, and that is the pairing of science, which is where many of us, especially in the SRM, come from, with art. Art is a tool for reaching people about conservation issues that may not necessarily have been thinking about those things. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm really excited to introduce you this evening to two um, fabulous California artists. Uh, I'm going to introduce them one at a time, and then they're going to take it away. So when I say things that are elaborations <laughs> or mysteries, you guys can jump in and correct me. Um, on the left, Natalie Arnoldi is from Malibu, California. Uh, Natalie is an alumna of Stanford University, and in 2014 she finished a master's degree um, in Earth Systems, specializing in ocean science and policy. Um, she also has a bachelor's in marine biology from Stanford. Uh, and during that time and since, she's conducted a great deal of research, um, primarily out of Hopkins Marine Station, focusing on large pelagic fish, and in particular sharks. Um, she's published some really interesting work, um, including a paper that got, got a lot of hits in the news about that they call it the singles bar. It's where the great whites from coastal California <laughs> seem to congregate in the middle of the ocean, and they they think they figured out what happened out there. Um, so Natalie studies great white sharks and other things. Um, but in addition to that science, she's devoted actually maybe is it fair to say the majority of your time in the last six or seven years. Um, to painting primarily in oil, um, and her paintings are 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 big in, in many ways, both in format also they're in increasing no notoriety with you know, that's like good good notoriety, um, <laughs> and so Natalie's been showing her work in various like, galleries like Ace Gallery in LA, but all around Los Angeles, San Francisco. Just got back from London, showing her work. So that's that's cool and exciting. Um, uh, painting in oil, so we're going to see some of what, what Natalie does. Um, to Natalie's right, your left, um, Ethan Estes. Ethan is from Santa Cruz, California, so he is driven down today. He's a little <laughs> under the weather, so cut him some Beautiful slack. Drive. Beautiful drive. <laughs> uh, Ethan is also an alumnus of Stanford University. He completed his master's in Earth Systems there in 2012 and a bachelor's at Stanford before that. Um, Ethan has also been involved in a great deal of science focusing primarily on ocean things and large pelagic fish and predators. Um, he's got some really interesting first author publications on things like the bioenergetics of various tuna species. And so if you wonder how you might study the bioenergetics of this, this huge, powerful fish, you can ask him how they accomplish that. It's, that's really neat. Um, but since he left Stanford, he's, in addition to traveling around the world to catch big fish and study them, he also is working as an artist. Um, he has a gallery in space in Santa Cruz, California, and has been building and displaying exhibitions pretty much all around the world, locally here in California, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Watsonville, but also in Hawaii, the Canary Islands, France. Um, and maybe you're not going to talk about it, but the, the, the thing he did at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, was a really neat project. Um, he just got back from Oahu doing a big installation um, at a huge professional surf contest that they were having there. Uh, did, did, I, did I miss any like huge things? Do you feel like <laughs> thoroughly, I like, feel like introduced? Yeah. I can't yeah. hear it. Yeah. Um, so the last thing that I'll say about them um, is that these two, maybe you might have suspected, they actually know each other, so that's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> and so they actually have been also working together a lot lately on an NGO project, an NGO that Ethan founded, which is called Countercurrent. Um, and I think they're going to talk about it in their talk, so I'm not going to say much more about it other than that um, 
Countercurrent is an NGO whose mission, whose purpose, uh, is to use art as sort of a new medium, a new vehicle to connect people who may not necessarily have been thinking about conservation and environmental issues with them. Um, so connecting with, communicating, connecting new audiences uh, to promote awareness of ocean issues. So they'll, they'll talk about Countercurrent and what their, their work with that organization and um, and, and so maybe I should stop. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Keep going, man. <laughs> no, you guys will be much more interesting. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dan. Um, thank you guys for having us. We're really excited to be here to talk to you about art and science um, and the overlap between the two and our perspectives on how art can contribute to environmental communication and conservation. Um, so as Dan said, Ethan and I know each other from college. Um, we both worked for a woman named Dr. Barb Block, who is one of the world's most renowned experts on large pelagic predator migration and physiology. Um, and since finishing our undergrads and masters, we both continued to work for Barb in different capacities, but mostly doing shark and tuna research. And obviously we're both artists. Um, and so in many ways we've had parallel career paths, but the way that we incorporate our passion for environmental science and, and conservation into our work is quite different. Um, so hopefully that contrast will be interesting for you guys. Uh, what we've planned is a pretty informal discussion. Um, I'm gonna start us out by talking a little bit about art and science and the overlap between the two, two disciplines. And then we're gonna tell you a little bit about ourselves and our work and how we arrived at this somewhat anomalous career path of being both <laughs> scientists and artists. And then Ethan's gonna talk about some organizations including his own that we've been working on um, and how they work in this collaborative space between art and science and how they're contributing to environmental communication, mostly through public art installations. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> okay, right. so, so art and science, we tend to think about and talk about these two disciplines as being disparate and unrelated. On the one side, we talk about science as being very precise and analytical, and art is this more amorphous, creative, unpredictable discipline. But if you think about these two processes and you strip away the methodology and the paradigms that are associated with each, they kind of come down to the same core process, which is creative problem solving. And this idea of art and science both being rooted in creativity isn't anything new. And I threw up this quote from the man himself, Albert Einstein, because I think it speaks to a lot of the topics that Ethan and I are gonna be addressing today, which is that after a certain high level of technical skills achieved, science and art tend to coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity, and form. The greatest scientists are artists as well. And this also is not a new concept. If you go back through history, a lot of our greatest thinkers and scientists were also artists, with Leonardo da Vinci being an obvious example. Another way that science has relied on art historically is that both rely on visualization of topics. So before photography, the only way to document specimens and experimentation was through drawing. Um, and for a long time, it wasn't uncommon for scientists to also be illustrators. Um, Ernst Haeckel was a German marine biologist and artist who was very famous for his documentation of new species, largely marine invertebrates. He also got pretty creative with some of his interpretations, which <laughs> aren't actually things in the ocean that look quite like this, but um, he's an example of uh, an artist scientist. And so we don't, hand draw our figures for scientific publications, mostly anymore. But this idea that um, as a scientist, it's very important to be able to come up with visual interpretations of your results and the implications of a study, right? Because even if your audience doesn't understand scientific jargon, they can look at your paper and look at your forms and figures and have some idea of what it is you're trying to communicate. This is an example from a 2015 science paper by a scientist named Doug McCauley that was taking a global perspective on species loss in the ocean and correlating it with defaunation and habitat loss on land and came up with some, some core corollaries of conservation actions that we can be taking now to slow down this process in the ocean. And so this is a literal example of a collaboration between artists and scientists towards trying to make this, this global perspective study more accessible to a broader audience. And it's also an example of how scientists have to think imaginatively about how you can translate data into a visual representation. It's a sweet figure. I can pass the baton. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say quickly that Natalie and I know Dan because he taught a, uh, well, he hosted a lecture series much like this when we were both students at Stanford in undergrad. Mm -hmm. and that was called The Social Ocean. 
And I thought that was a really good title. Uh, it summarizes, I think, what what we do and you know, also what Dan does, what it's all about, which is that, in my experience, it doesn't really matter what you're doing, whether it's art or science, it really comes down to having a good community of people who you can reach out to and bounce questions off of, ask for help. And what's cool is that you know, Natalie and I have been in this, you know, we've both been doing, had these parallel paths, and we can bounce these ideas off each other over time. And you know, it's cool to see her present stuff, because like, you know, she's grown as, grown as an artist, I'm trying to grow as an artist. We have our you know, different uh, paths. But it's, uh, it's cool to kind of come full circle, see Dan in his new home here. And you know, Dan also won, uh, we, we just learned he won a teaching award for that lecture series that he did and for many of his other classes at Stanford. And you guys are really lucky to have So um, <laughs> <laughs> I gave him very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the core of what, uh, this is kind of our theory of change. How, how, you know, when you try and pitch art as like a, a way to communicate about an environmental issue, people are gonna say, yeah, that's pretty hippy-dippy. Um, but it actually works. Uh, it, I, I believe that to be true in my own experience. And there's actually a fair bit of uh, literature, uh, research literature on that exact topic. Uh, this is my version of, why, of how it works and why it works in a way. Um, what art does, what good art does, is it connects you emotionally to a topic, to a visual stimulus, or an auditory stimulus, it could be music. Um, but it, it grabs you in a way that uh, it makes you feel something. Could be happy, could be sad, it makes you feel. Uh, some of my favorite art, personally, in, in addition to making you feel something, it, it tricks you. If for a second, you see something and then Oh, but it's not it's not as you thought. It it makes you think critically about what's happening, about who you are, about your relationship to the piece of artwork. Those two things to me are what make great artwork. In the best case scenario, that can result in, you know, what all of environmental education and outreach is all about is creating behavior change. Oh, I'm gonna be a hardcore recycler. I'm not I'm gonna I'm gonna even rinse out my mayonnaise jar when I you know before I recycle it, you know? That, that's, that's behavior change, you know? <laughs> that's, that's tangible uh, ac action. And that's, you know, in a lot of ways, the goal of, you know, the green generation, I would imagine, is to, you know, think twice before you use a, a single-use plastic thing. It's hard to do in the society because it's so easy. But our, you know, a lot of what environmental education is about is, is creating that individual behavior change and if enough people do that, that's when you get into the realm of cultural change. Art is a pillar of culture. Music, dance, all these things. They shape the way we feel about the world around us, about the clothes we buy, about the, you know, what is cool. I think art's cool. I don't know about you guys, but I think it's cool. Um, and, and, and that is, if enough people think something's cool and they vote for it, then you get into the realm of political change. And a cool example of that, well, backing up, the reason that works, even that, that first point of emotion, is that humans are not rational. We, we don't do things that, uh, you know, when, if you dump a, a statistic on me, like 90% of the big fish in the ocean are gone, I would say, that sucks, <laughs> but I love tuna sashimi, so I'm going <laughs> to still eat that tuna sashimi. Um, it's, if you appeal instead with a gut-wrenching depiction of, you know, you know, uh, why all the tuna are gone and where are they gone, then maybe I might actually think twice about ordering a Pokemon. Uh, not all tuna is bad, we'll get into that. Um, and that's a neural thing. We are, uh, you know, we, there's a lot, we're, we're emotional creatures and we engage with, uh, we remember things that connect to us emotionally. Uh, a good example of this going from the emotional side to the political side, which I think is a cool example, and there's a lot of old examples like this. Um, kind of from the, also from like the pre-camera days, uh, like old uh, woodblock engravings and stuff that people did of like uh, Yellowstone. Uh, well, they brought, you know, Ansel Adams, for example, most of us heard of him, uh, he sent a coffee table book to the Secretary of the Interior. Dude loved it, and he sends this note back to Ansel Adams, uh, you know, it's, it, it's gonna be a matter of fact, I'm gonna get Congress to act on this. There's gonna be a great national park, King's Canyon. It's like, power of a coffee table book. It's 
pretty cool. There is yeah. now a national park. If and and there, if you haven't been there, you should go. It's it's really not uh, it's in the Sierra. Uh, so you know it's an, it's a small example, but I, I think uh, you have to you have to see it and you have to know about it to care about it. So art is a way of communicating that. Um, Art's a subjective thing. It comes down to who you are, um, what your goals, you know, what your targets for success are. What what does art mean to you? Uh, and Natalie and I, and that's and that's shaped by your upbringing and, and what you care about. So Natalie and I are going to take you know 15 minutes or so to go through how we got to our personal definitions of art and how that's mixed with our interest in science. That's so. For me, uh, it can't, it, it, I, I, I was like making stuff. I sit went in my little playroom as a kid for hours, just building little things, and uh, I just like that flow state, you could call it, just sitting and making something. Uh, I learned to surf when I was a kid, and uh, I saw my neighbor making a surfboard, and I'm like, I could do that. Uh, so I started making boards in my backyard, and it's a chemical, you know, it's a little fun with chemistry, you mix the resins together, it turns into plastic, you sand it all down, it's all, you know, it's a creative process, it's, a sh it's sculptural, you shape a chunk of foam down, and you get, you know, you get to go play with it, it's pretty fun. Uh, I did a little bit of drawing, but I was never really into art, I really just like making surfboards growing up, <laughs> um, <laughs> and surfing, I love surfing, it, it, uh, my dad taught me to surf at a young age, he, he grew up surfing, it's something I do with him, uh, it's, a, it's a family connection. I'm not competitive with it, I just do it for fun um, and exercise. Uh, when I was 17, I went to uh, Ecuador. Uh, I was getting bad grades. My parents were getting had a bad attitude. My parents were getting sick of me, so they're like, you need to grow up. And so uh, the deal was if I went, if I pulled my grades up, they would, uh, and, uh, they, would they would basically buy me a, one, uh, a plane ticket, but if I could go to a different country by myself, and learn a language there. And that was their like, get out of the house, you're being a jerk. And that, that's why I, I was like, fine. And so I typed in surfing in Spanish on like early, <laughs> early, early, early Google. And I ended up spending two months on a beach living with a little family uh, in the middle of nowhere in Ecuador, uh, surfing by myself, drinking and smoking uh, cigarettes and playing backgammon and learning to speak Spanish very well. Oh, no, not very well, but like, <laughs> considering I was drinking and smoking and not, there were no textbooks involved. Um, I did get these figures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I kind of had a realization walking, walking the beaches. Growing up in Monterey, Santa Cruz area, you know, it's, it's like you guys have here. It's pretty nice, you know, they're nice waters. They're well maintained. Uh, there's regulations for fishing. You don't see a lot of a ton of you know plastic debris. Walking the beaches in Ecuador was like my my mind was blown. There were dead turtles all over, probably drowned in the local shrimp trawlers' nets. There's uh, plastic debris everywhere. Uh, there's like stripped mangrove, clear cut mangrove forest for the shrimp farming culture operation next door. My mind was just like blown. Like oh okay, it's not all you know sunshine and and, and daisies in the ocean. Um, Pairing that early life experience with the fact that I was pretty freaked out about sharks growing up in Santa Cruz, as Natalie will talk a bit more about, we have a healthy population of white sharks up there, and it's not really a risk. Like, you know, I, I have friends who've seen them, I've seen them, um, but it's like, you know, nobody, not that many people actually get injured or killed by white sharks, really. Uh, very few. Very few. But it's, uh, but it's still mentally really intense to be soaking your feet out there in dark water, being like, huh, like. You know they're there, you know, and they're, they're looking at you. You know when, when it's happening. So that fear in a high school translated to curiosity in a marine biology class. I learned about a, tra uh, a study going on where they're tagging the white sharks in my local waters, and uh, I was learning that they would actually leave the coast. I'm like, great, that's the time to go surf. Uh, <laughs> and now they'll talk more about it, but they migrate offshore to near Hawaii, and I just was like, that's the coolest stuff I've ever seen. Like, I want to learn more about that, and so I went to school. Uh, to, to, to study sharks and with this lady, Barb Block, that Natalie talked about. And uh, I was taking marine biology classes, loving that, just feeling like I had a good path, but I was missing something. I wasn't fulfilled personally. I was not making stuff. And I wanted to make surfboards, because that's all I really knew how to make. And I went knocking around all like machine shops and the wood shops, and they're like, nah, nah, you can't, you can't make surfboards here. Like, it's, it's a really messy process. It's really actually toxic. Like, fiberglass, dust, and all this stuff. So they're like, no, you cannot make surfboards on the market. 
Uh, so I'm like, fine. Uh, they're like, well, you can take a sculpture class and use this whole grad sculpture studio, which I saw your guys' sculpture studio today. Daniel showed me. It's very nice. I, if you haven't taken an art class, you should, because that's a sweet space. Um, so I took a sculpture class, and all of a sudden I was hooked. I didn't just, I couldn't just make, you know, utilitarian things anymore. It was a way of, they taught me to, in, in our class, to try and tell stories through material, through this, through the history of the material. These are all reclaimed, it's all junk, it's all reclaimed stuff, uh, you know, the bleach bottles and old PVC pipe that's all scrap. And uh, I wanted to try and tell the story of the California brown pelican, which was almost went extinct uh, uh, due to use of pesticides like PDT. That's Dan's favorite bird. Really? <laughs> yeah. how, how did I not know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's an iconic species. I have another piece I made about that, a uh, performance piece I did about the pelican. But basically they almost got wiped out, and as did many other uh, seabirds, due to PDT and eggshell thinning, bioaccumulation, all that good stuff. And I wanted to describe the upward, you know, the, the decline due to pesticide pollution and the upward increase due to grassroots activism. Have you heard of Rich Carson? Sound of Spring, good. She, she started the whole game. Uh, she, she wrote her book, uh, just created an uproar around pesticide use and a lot of uh, in investigation around pesticide use and uh, that grassroots activism you know, basically led to the banning DDT for agricultural pur purposes and the population of pelicans recovered. So this piece was kinetic, it moved up and down, they fl flopped or flapped as they came up and uh, it was kind of hectic but it worked. And uh, I realized for the first time in my life that I could actually use the things I was learning in science class, use the fact that I like making stuff, and actually m make something that meant something. You know? So I got lucky, and I, I, when I was doing my master's, I got a gig at the, the landfill, which doesn't sound that cool, but it was fun. Uh, <laughs> the San Francisco landfill has a program called Recology. And uh, basically, I did the student version of it, which is not very glorious. They give you a shipping container and a shopping cart. Uh, but you get access to all of the cool stuff. It was an artist the, residency, to clarify. It's a residency, yes. I was, <laughs> well, I felt like I was living there, but I wasn't actually living there. It's um, <laughs> like your normal <laughs> job at the dump, you yeah. as art. <laughs> Good to clarify. Um, the, uh, basically, you pick through the trash and you get an exhibition at the end of it. So I, you know, on any given day, I had like, you know, mannequin parts. I still need to make some out of those. Um, I have like a box of. I have too much stuff for that still. Uh, I, I found a bunch of rope and I took a bunch of chunks of styrofoam, glued them up on a piece of plywood, like basically the same way you make a surfboard, you know, and I shaped it. And uh, I had all this rope that I found and I wrapped it. Uh, and I made this piece. I got lucky and got to show it at the San Francisco airport for about a year for lots of people to see. I and saw it there. It was really cool. If you flew United in 2015, <laughs> you saw it. <laughs> so, it, was a, it was a really cool opportunity to be able to put my work on a big platform like that. Um, and all that was really encouraging. Uh, I knew I wanted to be an artist. And just when I was about to graduate and get in a van and drive to Chile and surf and do art projects, I got an email from none, none other than Bar Block saying, hey, like, we have a technician position. Do you want to, you, you got to come work for it. I was going to drive to Chile. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I couldn't say no to using the degree I just spent five years getting. Uh, so I was reticent to leave the art dream behind, but I went and I can't, I, it, was, it turned out pretty cool. I got, I got to travel around the world, catch, uh, tag and release bluefin tuna all over. That's about a thousand wow. pounder wow. up in Nova Scotia. Natalie was just up there this last season. Um, we're putting electronic markers on these fish to tag them and see where they go. Uh, did, you, did you say like just two seconds about why bluefin tuna are amazing? Okay, yeah. Uh, we're looking at that picture. I know, it's kind of a laser. Yeah. So look at that big belly. Um, <laughs> this is what the industry around uh, bluefin is for. This right here is tuna belly, otoro. And 90% of the bluefin that's caught in the world ends up in Japanese markets um, because the, they have a refined taste for fatty tuna. Uh, personally, when I eat bluefin, I don't quite like the belly. It's really, it's really, uh, it's kind of greasy almost. Like, and you know, I, the cuts up here are more and more lean. So that's what drives basically is driving the near extinction of bluefin around the world. They're an amazing fish. They're highly migratory, as this slide shows. Uh, we tag them up here, 
in Nova Scotia, and they swim down into the Gulf of Mexico to spawn, right where the BP oil uh, spill was, and then they come right back up to forage here. And they also, if they feel like it, this, sh this slide is just uh, showing the residency in the Western uh, Atlantic, but they easily cross over into the Med and, uh, and spawn over there as well. Um, so they, they, they go wherever they want. Um, there's three populations, or three species, Atlantic bluefin tuna, Pacific bluefin tuna, and Southern bluefin tuna. Uh, they're all very similar when you look at them, but th they all are endothermic, meaning they're warm, warm blooded, uh, just like us. They eat a meal, they take the heat from breaking down the chemical bonds of that meal, and they warm their core, which is very rare among fish. White sharks also do it, um, and a couple of other species as well. But they're, they're just incredible. They're like the Ferraris of the sea. They can just swim <laughs> 50 miles an hour. They're, they're totally insane. The military was paying us, and the Navy was paying us to study them which is kind of scary because there's going to be like tuna bombs out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, like I said, I also learned from working as a, a scientist, you come back to the dock at the end of the day of doing like, cool, like high five, we're saving them, tagging them, studying them. And then you were confronted with reality that, you know, the science is kind of a drop in the bucket. There's this, for every fish you tag, there's 10 with their head and tail lopped off, ready to get iced up and shipped to Tokyo. And uh, that's just kind of like, you know, you start to think of them, you start to realize that they're actually just, you think they're beautiful, but they're actually a commodity. And that they get traded, you know, from this backwater town in the middle of nowhere in you know, Nova Scotia, next day air to Tokyo, because somebody's going to drop, you know, up to two million bucks on that fish. Um, typical price at the dock is about 10 grand. The first fish of the year can be, go for up to two million dollars, because it's a prestigious thing in Japan to, to buy the first fish of the year. Average price in Japan would be probably for a fish like that, probably $30,000. Uh, so it's, it's pretty heavy to see that, and I wanted to uh, kind of capture the memory of the fish, so I took a tail back, because they chopped the tail off, and I took one back to the hotel room and brought a bunch of rice paper and made some, some prints. These are, they're fun, they're quite big, and I'm uh, selling those to, for uh, and donating some of the proceeds to the nonprofit, to a nonprofit that studies these fish. Um, and then uh, Natalie and I both did a, a, a show uh, with some other artists. We all got these same uh, fiberglass models from a taxidermist out in Florida. And they're like eight feet long, and they're maybe only, they're like fiberglass, they're like way nothing. And uh, we each did our own thing with them. So I covered mine in 50,000 rhinestones, just dubstep, just one at a time. <laughs> and uh, it was horrible. Um, and Natalie did this really beautiful uh, deep sea painting, uh, because Tuna actually spent a lot of their time in the deep ocean, which not many people know about. Uh, we showed those at the Monterey Bay Aquarium um, and uh, for an international symposium on bluefin conservation, which was really fun. Uh, and then, I, I, about three years of working at the aquarium full time, or two years really, I, I just couldn't, I, I knew I was not fulfilled personally. Like, I love fish, I love field work. A lot of science is sitting at a computer as well. Uh, that's one thing I've learned, which is, which is <laughs> if, if that's your thing, it's cool. But I, I was starting to get to the point where I, wanted to try something else. So I, 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 I did quit. They let me have a part-time position, so I still do field work for them. Um, and I started a gallery and studio in Santa Cruz. Um, obviously a bunch of tuna artwork in there. It's my little dream studio. Uh, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to take on different creative projects. This one's a dance piece I did. Um, based around the California brown pelican, Dan's favorite bird. Uh, it's, it was in honor of Dan, actually. Um, uh, uh, it was a performance piece with the modern dance troupe. I made the costumes out of scrap material, and it went through the life cycle of, you know, the, the, of the process of uh, pesticide pollution to near extinction to recovery through grassroots activism. It's kind of a po one of the few positive environmental stories, so I keep returning to it in my work. Um, yeah, kind of, it had like a fun like video projection overlay piece, yeah, component, so like crop dusting, pesticides, all that good stuff. Uh, and at the same time, I've just been doing uh, tuna work seasonally. I, I go to Japan for uh, a couple times a year, or every summer, for about a month at a time, working with the Japanese government to tag and release uh, bluefin over there with electronic tags, which is fun because they had never done it before in their waters, and it's kind of an a easing of relations the Japanese are very closed with their uh, their fisheries. They don't want input from from Western uh, Western uh, scientists and such. So it's been really cool to be in this kind of liaison role over there, uh, just sharing you know what I know about fish. And uh, it'll, it'll be my third field season. So it's fun. You live with all Japanese guys. I don't speak any Japanese really. So it's just like full cultural immersion. You like <laughs> sleep on the floor and 
you know, as all my as all my equipment laid out on the floor. It's totally uh, a, a fun, immersive experience. They started to trust me more. They let me like tag the fish. This was a little electronic tag going inside this little baby tuna right there. And that little baby tuna will swim from Japan to California in as little as a month. Wow. Zing. Super fast. <laughs> and then you get to, just being in Japan, you get to learn about, uh, the, you know, go from where that tuna is being shipped from Nova Scotia, it ended up on the floor here in Tsukiji Market. Recently I've been making stuff out of old fishing rope that I find, or reclaimed from fishermen. So I cut it carefully, and this is inspired by my time in Japan, because these are traditional Japanese, you know, representations of water. And so these are about four feet wide, um, and, uh, I got the detail. Oh, no. But uh, that's what I'm making these days. Cool. That's turn. <laughs> yeah, so um, Ethan and I have a little bit of a different story. So um, like Ethan, I grew up in Southern California on the beach, grew up surfing, tide pooling, being in the ocean, and from a very young age had aspirations of wanting to be a marine biologist. I think I was seven when I informed my parents that I was going to be a shark biologist. <laughs> it was something that a lot of people say at that age, but it, I never grew out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the same time, I grew up in a house where my father is a well-known abstract painter and my mom is a novelist. So obviously I had a totally normal childhood. <laughs> <laughs> my dad in his studio making massive abstract paintings. And so for me, growing up in this household, creativity was an integral part of everyday life. I had wooden floors in my bedroom so that I could paint and draw and make a mess. I had a glue gun by the time I was five. Um, and from a very early age, I had these two highly developed um, aspects of my personality where on the one hand, I was obsessed with marine biology. I was conducting my own little experiments in tide pools and going out and monitoring and marine invertebrates moving around. And I was also highly productive in developing my sensibilities for visual expression. Um, strangely, I never really thought I'd be a professional artist. Um, I think in part because I was so set on being a marine biologist and I knew that you had to go to school and study to be a scientist. And my father, who's a successful artist, didn't go to art school. So when I grew up and it came time to go to college, um, I went off with every intention of going just studying biology and becoming a scientist. Um, and I got to Stanford, started working in Barb's lab, doing incredible field work, working with great white sharks and bluefin tuna, and felt very reaffirmed in that passion and that dream. I also took an oil painting class, and at Richard Sound, I kind of hokey, I found my medium and fell in love with oil paint and sort of found my voice artistically um, and started producing a lot of paintings. And through a sort of serendipitous series of events, ended up having my first art show at 19 and started showing, selling paintings in galleries. And all of a sudden, as a teenager, had these two cl seemingly clearly defined career trajectories, and all of the adults in my life started asking me, what are you going to choose? Are you going to be an artist, or are you going to be a scientist? And so I started having to think about, there, here are these two, passion, these two passions that I feel equally, um, feel like are equally important to me. Is it possible, possible to be an artist and a scientist, and how can I fulfill this dream to do both of these? Um, and growing up in the household that I did, my father's an abstract painter. I grew up around a community of artists who are very much purist and traditionalists in the sense that if you are an artist, sorry, I'm leaving the slide up for a long time. This is one of my paintings. <laughs> I'll get to it in a second. Um, if you are an artist, your job is to make a good painting or a good sculpture. Um, and didactic art or incorporating a social or political narrative into your work is secondary. First and foremost, you need to make a good painting. And so my early work, I didn't really think about incorporating environmental narratives because my background told me that your job is to make an emotionally and intellectually evocative painting. So I just started painting things that I thought were emotionally and intellectually interesting. And a lot of my work still um, uses this sort of misty atmospheric quality where all of my work is representational, but I sort of flirt with that line of abstraction where I give you enough information to place you in a certain time and place but it's ambiguous enough that you need to project some sort of personal narrative into the work. And so a lot of the things that I paint are these sort of universally relatable images. This is kind of faint, but it's an airplane in fog. So it's relatable, it's ambiguous, but it becomes personal, personal because um, these icons that I'm painting are universally relatable. The thing was, so I started showing my, this work, um, every time I get up to give a gallery talk, or sit down and write an artist statement, I found that I ended up talking about environmental science and conservation. Mm -hmm. And these environmental narratives, even though I wasn't intentionally incorporating them into my work, started cropping up. 
Um, and so there's this moment when I realize that I'm, I'm talking, I'm addressing these issues anyways, how can I be a little bit more intentional about how I work these environmental narratives into my work? Um, so gas stations at night, there's an obvious implication there with fossil fuels and the environment. I, I honestly, when I made these paintings, my subconscious, I'm sure, was thinking about the environmental implications, but I approached these paintings from a totally emotional standpoint, and someone else pointed out to me at some point that, oh, yeah, these are environmental paintings. Um, so I got to this moment when I started thinking about um, what is it that I'm studying and hearing about and spending a lot of time thinking about, because in the same way that being an environmental scientist means that no matter what you study, inevitably you end up studying climate change and anthropogenic effects <laughs> on the environment. And because I was so immersed in the scientific world, these narratives were showing up in my work. So this is a, a series that I did of Shanghai and the Smog. And I was um, a TA for an introduction to environmental science class at the time. And we had a professor come in and lecture about air quality. And he started his presentation with these really beautiful images of what looked like skylines in the fog, which appealed to me as an artist, a lot of my work uses fog. Um, and there are these serene seeming images that become deeply disturbing when you realize that what you're actually seeing is this toxic waste that is resulting in hundreds of thousands of people dying every year prematurely. This is another series I did of, I, I tend to work on a very large scale, so this is a 7 by 11 foot painting of a wave. Um, this is deep sea bioluminescence. Wait, can we turn off the light to see that one? Good idea. Yeah. Sure. I don't know. I don't know. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. No, 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 no. The one on the wall. Very bottom switch on the wall. No. Okay. <laughs> There's so many buttons over here. Good, good call. We never even yeah. That looks good. Um, yeah, so like I said, I, I had this moment of realization where I was getting up to give these artist talks, writing these artist statements, and I was addressing environmental issues. And it was this exciting moment where I realized that I was giving, I was implementing conservation education in non-traditional settings to non-traditional audiences. Art collectors sometimes can be environmentalists, but many of the people who were coming to my openings and coming to my art talks were not expecting to leave with information about smog and air pollution or <laughs> shark conservation, which is a series that I'll get to next. So one of the ways in which um, I, my, my best example of how I've incorporated one of the topics of scientific research that I've worked on into my work is great white sharks. And so this is a figure from a paper that our lab, the lab that Ethan and I work in, um, collaborated on with a bunch of other labs who put satellite tags on animals. And what we're really trying to do is give a sense that the global ocean, how these highly migratory species use our global ocean. So this, this is a study that collated data, data on everything from humpback whales to great white sharks, turtles, mola molas. And great white sharks are like that figure that you can show right in here and they come back to Hawaii and go back. Um, in 2015, I was working out in the field with our team that puts um, tags on white sharks. And we worked with the Discovery Channel um, to make a program for Shark Week. So I'm just going to show you this clip of, so you get an idea of what we do when we're out in the field. Um, and one of the narratives that we were focusing on in our documentary was every year we get oh, the same shark. Fish. <laughs> so, so, okay, I'll pause. So here's, uh, obviously here's the shark. Um, this is us on the boat. We have a piece of industrial carpet cut out to look like a seal. There's a GoPro mounted on the bottom of that thing. And we lure the shark up to the boat. Here it comes. Nom, nom, nom. Um, <laughs> this is a colleague of ours who's trying to put a camera tag on the fin of this shark, which turned out to be a much more difficult thing <laughs> than we thought it would be. Wow. Who's flying the drone? Uh, we had a drone pilot come out with us. Or are they on the They're on a different boat. On the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're really amazing animals. And what's interesting about these sharks is we, we have these three aggregation sites where we go out and put satellite tags on these sharks. And we find that year after year, we get the same individuals that come back to these aggregation sites. Great white sharks on the back side of their dorsal fin have a ridging that's unique to each individual. And we have sharks that we get to know. We give them names. They have personalities. Some are really curious and will come up and hang out around the boat for hours on end. Others are really shy, and it's hard to coax them up to the surface to put a tag on them. 
and so this this idea that the same sharks come back every year is interesting from a scientific standpoint because it helps us understand how the sharks are using these different areas that, that we see them returning to every year. So that's interesting from a, a scientific standpoint. Yeah. Sorry, I may have missed it, but where is this from? Oh, this is Año Nuevo. It's about 20 miles north of Santa Cruz. Oh. Mm -hmm. So when Ethan's talking about surfing and knowing they're there, they're there. No one, pretty, pretty much no one gets bitten, and they definitely are there. So there should be some <laughs> <laughs> We dock our research boat out of Santa Cruz every morning, and then we drive it up to Año. And yeah, in the fall, from there. But um, we see surfers the whole way up and the whole way back, and they're not interested in us. Um, what was I talking about? Coaxing sharks. Coaxing sharks. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You got me back on track. Um, so this idea that individuals come back to the same sites every year is interesting scientifically. Just quick in and out to the full screen. Oh, there we go. Um, and so we can use this concept for not only understanding different regions of their migration, but we can also use this to do something called a mark recapture model, which can allow us to do a population estimate. From a conservation standpoint, this narrative that the same sharks come back every year and we get start to view them as individual entities and not just big scary fish is valuable in overcoming that fear factor which is such a barrier in shark conservation. A lot of people are very afraid of sharks, but if you can start to engage them on a level of these sharks have distinct personalities, we see them come back every year, um, it's a very valuable narrative um, from a conservation standpoint and that's something that we were focusing on in that documentary for Shark Week. As a painter, I also saw an interesting opportunity of how can I use this, um, this education opportunity and use portraiture um, to create an empathic connection with great white sharks that maybe hasn't been done before. So I made life-size portraits of some of the sharks we see every year. Um, this is an 18-foot female named Gigi. This painting is 24 feet long and 8 feet high. Yeah, her name is Gigi. <laughs> um, this is a 14-foot male named Hawkeye a nine foot male named Milo, and a 12 foot male named Menace. <laughs> and after I produced this series, I had this show in a big gallery space, and it was really interesting to watch people interact with these paintings, because some of us are lucky and we get to interact with these animals on a, on a pretty frequent basis, but most people are never gonna get the opportunity to interact with an 18 foot gray white shark. And so it was fascinating to see people not only interact with the paintings, but also be in the gallery and listen to the kinds of conversations that came out of people interacting with these, with these pieces. Which brings us back to this idea of fostering emotional connection with conservation issues through art. Um, there is a, a sort of experiential learning that you can foster through pieces of art um, that is very different from traditional methods of environmental communication. Kind of back to that uh, theory of change. What Natalie's tapping into there is when you walk up to these paintings, you feel, well, depends on, I can't speak for everybody. I, I feel like fear, awe, awe is the right word. And actually, that's the way it is in real life. There, it's more, you feel more awe seeing an 18 foot wide shark swim by you and when you're standing in the boat, that is, than you do fear. They're just, it's just hard to believe that something like that exists. They're so big, it looks like a whale, you know? There's like, how is, you know. And it's not just that they're big, they're fat. They're, they're, their girth <laughs> is remarkable. They don't, I, I once saw a 12 foot shark swimming by, and, and then a, again, this 18 foot female right behind it. And you could see like, the little guy was silhouetted, it looked like a toothpick. And like the 12 foot male is a toothpick, and the 18 foot female was like a minibus. You know, they, they, they don't just get longer, they get, bigger <laughs> and the belly gets bigger because yeah. So that that emotion that sense of awe triggers uh, an emotional yeah, you know, that's an emotional response that Natalie's uh, paintings convey. And it makes you think, wow, like makes you curious, makes you want to learn more about sharks. Um, and that's something that's very neat that's totally necessary. Sharks over the past you know, since Jaws came out in the sixties I think. Uh, maybe the early seventies. Uh, they had a hard run. Basically, something like 70 to 100 million sharks get caught and killed for their fins every year. Um, that's been happening on our watch, uh, basically in part because of a lack of apathy for these animals. They're not furry, they don't have big eyes, they're not particularly cute. Although some, you know, sometimes they look cute. I like the Milo one, he's, 
That lack of empathy actually has uh, it ha actually has uh, conservation outcomes. We don't care about sharks, so we let them get turned into soup. Um, that's something that arts that emotional connection is something that's changing in a lot of ways. Sometimes partly through art, also through people interacting with sharks in ways that people didn't think they could. Uh, Ocean Ramsey, you ever heard of her? No. She's awesome. Uh, she's a supermodel, uh, but she also swims with, uh, and a professional freediver, but she also swims with, you know, any kind of shark you can put her next to, uh, including, you know, white sharks, uh, which, you know, when Jaws came out, people thought, if you got in the water with a great white shark, you're going to die. Um, and she, you know, it's not a safe thing to do, but if you, Spend enough time diving with sharks. Natalie's done a ton of diving with sharks. It's 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 like being around a dog. Like if that dog is clearly pissed off, it, you should probably get out of that area. And you can read those signs for, for your own experience. You kind of do the same sh thing with sharks to some extent. They're always in control. You have to accept that. But you, if you're calm and you read them, you know you're you're going to be fine. So um, that's that's uh, pe seeing images of people swimming with white sharks. Uh, like Ocean Ramsey and others, is changing the way we feel about sharks, as is this type of uh, kind of grassroots and uh, this artistic message. Um, changing gears a little bit, but more like trying to put an umbrella over all this in a way. Um, part of Natalie and I have been really lucky to get exposed to the animals we've been exposed to, the research we've been exposed to. It's I don't know how. Yeah, we got lucky. We met Barb Block, and she led us into her world, and. Uh, Part of uh, part of you guys are studying the environment, and uh, to my knowledge, is, is a range of different folks. Is but part of learning about the ocean and the environment is that the more you learn, the more you have responsibility. I think to do something about it, with that information to, to preserve it. Um, so I got lucky. I, got, I went to the March for Science in D.C. this year, uh, this last year, and uh, it's first time I've ever been to the Capitol. It was really cool. Um, just being, you know, around a, a protest of that scale, totally, and, you know, it was totally inspiring, and it instilled in me a sense of of trying to use the platform that I've been will, working to build through my art and science work in a more of a public advocacy type of way. Um, there's groups that already do this. These guys are rad. They're called Pangea Seed. Uh, they basically aggregate talent. They hit up muralists from all over the world. And they say, okay, we're meeting in New Zealand on these dates. We're setting up, we're, we're scoping out all the walls, and everybody gets a wall. So do something based around an ocean issue, uh, and go big or go home. Uh, so you know, this one's talking about shark finning, you know, in, in, in China and the issue there. Uh, I got another beautiful mural about the, the classic polar bear issue. Uh, this one was a, a different group, uh, Wild Days nonprofit. They funded a bunch of artworks uh, in Hong Kong, where most of the shark fins in the world get shipped to, and uh, that's just a bitch in sculpture. Um, so it really gets at the, you know, the shark fin trade, like hits you in the face. It's 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 like slapstick, like it's 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 so uh, it's, it's it's in your face, but like it, it makes you feel and understand in in, in one moment. Um, I wanted to try and create a platform uh, where I could kind of uh, aggregate the both scientists and the artists I have met over the years, um, and, and those that I haven't met yet, to, to start funding these types of artworks um, and, uh, and to, to speak about ocean issues. So I'm calling it Countercurrent. Um, I'm lucky to have Dan on the board of directors and his wife, mm -hmm. Ashley. Uh, so they get to pick their brains about how to make this thing grow. It's in its early days. I haven't been able, it's a side project for sure. Like I'm trying to fund my, keep, pay the rent of my studio, and uh, you know, I, I, I can't put that much time into it, but I'm trying to build it slowly and properly, applying for grants, uh, you know, all those reports you're writing right now, that's all gonna come in handy, because <laughs> someday you're gonna say, I wanna get a grant, and it's basically the same exact process of doing, writing a research paper and defending your ideas. It kind of integrates in the whole concept of STEAM, which is a buzzword that gets thrown around. You've probably heard of STEM more, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math is STEM, and I fundamentally believe that if you mix art into that, you're going to grab a whole different se subset of people. There's people who say, I suck at math. They, they say, I, I don't want to do anything with numbers, but
but you watch that person doodling in math class and they're making the coolest thing. You know, like, like I can't draw for my life. Um, and you watch these kids who are just, you know, so talented. That person is going to understand uh, mathematics or any type of, you know, science-based concept much better through an artistic you know, uh, learning process. So it does have its place, and that's what I'm trying to focus on. Um, I'm trying to fund this series of youth art science workshops in my hometown of Watsonville. It's an agricultural community, uh, primarily Latino, and uh, there's, I would, there's, there's notably fewer opportunities uh, in terms of access to you know, ocean programs, and uh, a lot of kids don't even go to the beach, even though it's a couple miles away. Uh, so I'm trying to, uh, to leverage the Countercurrent project. My buddy runs an, a, a, a maker space for kids. It's called the Environmental Science Workshop. And I'm trying to uh, bring talented artists and scientists into that workshop, get kids inspired, and say, hey, let's make something cool. But not just cool, let's make something real. Let's make some real artwork that we're going to show in a big show together at City Hall. So uh, this was like a pilot project I did where this was a younger age group. I'm going to start, I, I want to focus on high school because that's when kids actually are, uh, they're kind of trying to figure out what to do with their lives primarily, but I mean, I'm still trying to figure out what to do. Uh, but uh, this was just like, this was a, a younger age group that I'm showing here. Uh, but this kid came up with this really cool one, talking about pelicans again. Uh, we had a whole flock, all these birds came together. Um, you know, we, we, we showed them a lot, you know, put them along a fence in, at a local elementary school as an installation, uh, which I don't have a piece of, uh, picture of. But more, most importantly, we had a lot of fun. Uh, and this kid definitely got the point. This kid's dad's a farmer, and you know, to be having this conversation, the conversation. I would, I wish I could have been at the dinner table that night talking about this, you know, this piece, the engagement of his dad's responsible for putting, you know, the the pesticides on the berry fields, which run off into the local slough and the wetlands, and that that type of engagement is, you know, that's what environmental education is about. It's about how how do you make decisions about your relationship with the environment. So um, part of what. If, whenever you're going to try and write a grant for uh, to get a project funded, uh, they always ask about evaluation, capital E. Evaluation means how are you going to test if the project that you just proposed to me, how are you going to test if it actually worked? How are you going to test if those kids learned anything? If they if it had a meaningful conservation outcome, is how they usually say it. So, and it's the most important part of the grant, like. If you should, if you, if you have time in college, take a social science class on how do you write a survey, how do you design a survey, because that's essentially what. Uh, the, if you want to win a grant, that's what you have to do. Uh, one of the things I pitched to a grant, I didn't get the grant. I just found out yesterday <laughs> from the California Coastal Commission. Uh, and, uh, I'll try again. Uh, what I, I'm trying to pitch a more innovative approach where it's like kids are spending all their time on their smartphones. I do, uh, unfortunately, and. Uh, there's little mechanisms within, say, Instagram stories where you can pull, and if you can link that to the lecture you just gave, um, you know, you can get some kind of metric if kids are actually absorbing the stuff, if they're interested in it. Um, you know, you kind of you kind of have to move with the times, and it, it, it's I'm sure Instagram's probably already outdated, but uh, it's part of a way of evaluating the success of your efforts. Uh, an example of a countercurrent project we just pulled off last week. Uh, I was in Oahu. I linked up um, again back to the social ocean idea. My buddy runs a nonprofit called uh, our, our buddy runs a nonprofit called Save the Waves. They do coastal uh, protection to protect uh, important surf spots for a lot of reasons. Uh, he connected me. You know, oh, you want you're going to Hawaii? Great. Meet Kahi. Texted Kahi. Runs a, a nonprofit called Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii. Really big, awesome nonprofit over there that does beach cleanups. Hawaii sticks out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. All the debris that washes away from LA or from Tokyo or from uh, China, it meets in the middle and it gets washed up on Hawaii's beaches. So there's tons and tons of fishing gear. There's this popular tree out there called a banyan tree. Uh, they have these, they kind of strangle native trees. They, they climb up uh, from the bottom, or sorry, a bird drops them on top and they grow down and they strangle a tree and they kill it. I thought that was a kind of a cool metaphor for uh, what plastic does to wildlife as well. So we just made that piece during the Volcom Pipe Pro, which is a big surf contest, thousands of people at the beach, so trying to raise a little bit of awareness around the issue there. The takeaway from this talk, as uh, said best by her deepness, is that I suggest to everyone, look in the mirror, ask yourself, who are you? What are your talents? Use them and do what you love. 
That's what we're trying to do, and I hope that for you too. Thanks, you guys. That was fabulous. So I have a couple. I'll put you. You should go stand up there. So I have a couple of questions that I'll. I'm gonna throw to these guys, and then we'll open it up to the rest of you. If you, if you, it's seven. Ish. If you need to sneak out, you can just sneak out through the back, um, real quiet, like. Or, we're on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you've been, you kind of got it just right here at the very end. It's in this question of evaluation, and how do you, like, how can you tell what kind of impacts you're making? Do you guys, either you have any concrete stories about seeing seeing impacts out there from your work, either in art or in science or in both? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's an impact necessarily because she was already really into it. Uh, when I had that piece up at the uh, San Francisco airport, I would like fly through there and uh, I would go to the United Lounge and I got to talk with the lady behind the counter and I told her, oh yeah, I, yeah, I made that whale piece. And she just flipped out. She was like, oh my god, oh my god, that's my favorite thing in the world. She started showing me pictures of her last trip to go see the gray whales in Mexico. She like took me back out there, took a picture with me. She was stoked on it, like kind of a little too much. So and one, one line changed. It, well, I think she was really into whales in the first place, but it, that kind of feedback is pretty cool. Uh, it's something direct, a direct good feel anyway. <laughs> But, uh. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to evaluate how my paintings might change people's behavior, but it is really interesting running into people. So it's been two years now since I had that shark show, but I run into people now and, oh my god, I love Gigi, I remember seeing that painting. So there is something to be said for a strong piece of artwork sticking with people, and she remembers not only the painting, but the information that I gave her along with cool. it. And so I don't know how you evaluate that necessarily? Subjective with the arts. Um, part of it is uh, it comes into your definition of success as an artist. Or do you want to be a commercial artist and sell work? Uh, or do you want to be an installation artist and make work that has a statement and nobody's going to pop to buy it and put it in their living room? Those are different, very different things. So uh, I evaluate the success of my work based on a mix of both. If it sells, that's good, because then I get to keep making more artwork and paying the rent. And if people get the message, that's very helpful. That makes me feel warm inside. Um, so OK, so segueing <laughs> from that, uh, so having been productive in both the science space and kind of in the, the, the currency of the realm in science, which is publishing in peer-reviewed journals, so having done that, and having been successful in the, the currency of the realm in the art space of like making it as working professional artists, um, can you guys compare, contrast, but like the impacts that you think that that might have, the the warm fuzzies that may or may not feel like if you're if the goal is if the goal is save the ocean, you've done you've done it you've you've like engaged with this from both sides and how is it how is it different or better or worse one way or the other. Again, comes down to targets for success. What does success mean to you? Feeling good and warm inside, that's part of it. But um, that's kind of what keeps you coming back for more, right? Feeling like you feel good when you, when you had something that's successful. But I don't know. I think that's kind of what countercurrent is about for me personally, is that I, I think that if you put artwork in the right place at the right time in front of the right audience, you can, for example, the Ansel Adams, Sarah, you can create real world change in, in a meaningful way. So I haven't done that yet. Uh, that's, a, that's a goal. Uh, I don't even know what battle. I, it, it, that's the thing about ocean issues, right? It's like, do you want to focus on plastic pollution or shark finning or you know tuna conservation? There's a lot to handle, and it's actually very much overwhelming. I haven't gotten very specific with that. I have a lot of scientific background around tuna. I don't make that much tuna artwork. Maybe there's something I need to figure out in my own life, but you know, it's eventually I'll get there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this is specifically going to answer your question, but it is something interesting to think about. I mean, you can be a world class scientist writing papers on bluefin tuna migration and how we're catching too many of them and it's harming the population. 
and that can do absolutely nothing for bluefin tuna conservation if that information doesn't get out there and it isn't implemented into policy and people don't learn about it. And the same thing is true with paintings. I can be making fantastic paintings and if I just show them in one gallery in LA where people see them and they think they're pretty, it's not necessarily gonna act change. So that next component of how you take good science or good art and make it enact real change, is I don't have a great answer to that, but it is interesting to think about how in both of those disciplines you can be really excellent at that job, but if you wanna change the world, there's a next step that has to do with advocacy and communication I think you hit that though in, in a sense that one of the things that Natalie is highlighting is that you, by crossing disciplines, you inevitably, if nothing else, you reach a different audience. And I think there's a lot of message fatigue that happens around ocean science and ocean issues within the ocean community that you already heard. Yeah, we, we, yeah. how many times do you need to be told about plastic pollution or? Uh, See the polar bear on the iceberg. Yeah, right? it's it, it's it's too it's almost too much, right? And I think that part of uh, what we're trying to do in some ways is is to get outside of that bubble. Um, it's no point in trying to convert the converted. Granted, this is not a religious thing. It's a it's a sustainability thing for everybody. But uh, reaching a different audience is, is definitely a success in itself. Thank you guys. So we open it up. If, if you guys are, by all means, something tickled your brain. Monica James. What's the JPL project? Ooh. Oh, <laughs> I, get that ready. I, I forgot about that one. Uh, um, I didn't. Uh, uh, I took a class as an undergrad. It was one of the coolest things. Uh, it was the coolest class I ever took. They brought a visiting artist in. Except for dance, of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, they brought a visiting artist in. You should check this guy out. His name is Ruben Margolin. Uh, he it was a Harvard uh, mathematician who dropped his professional you know, math career and wanted to make kinetic scu sculptures. So he makes sine wave sculptures, kinetic sine wave sculptures, up in the East Bay uh, in Berkeley. They do this basically, but he has these incredible mechanical systems that are just beautiful to look at that create these organic patterns. Uh, he taught a class. Uh, we he basically we all brainstormed up the sculpture. He had already won a grant through Jet Propulsion Laboratories to make this thing, and so he basically it was actually a smart deal for him. He just had us make it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it, it came out. Say, I wish I had a picture. It's a bunch of soda cans. It was like. Uh, it, and beer cans, uh, and they oscillated um, like this, mechanic, two, two mechanical sine waves. Um, so and computer computer science and mechatronics and all coming together the with The beautiful art. thing is there's no computers in his work, yeah. so it's it's all mechanical, mechanical. which is a dying you know, field. Uh, and uh, it's what taught me how to make that pelican sculpture. I took this class, I was sitting on my surfboard at Carmel Beach, I watched a flock of pelicans fly by. We were interning with Barb that summer, and I watched them fly by, I'm like, I can make that. It's a kinetic, it's a sine wave. And we went back to our little our dorm and I bent some uh, clothes hangers and I was like, I'm gonna write a grant. And you know, he, the dude totally inspired me. He showed me how to do it and I took it in my own direction. So I wanna come to CSUCI into that workshop and we'll all make a sculpture together. Sweet. That's Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you've got all the debris, so that's <laughs> <laughs> all the ocean trash ready to go. Seriously, we do. It's crazy. I, I got the studio. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Quick question. Why fog? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um, so, I think like you had all this gray and white paint. Yeah, <laughs> I am very monochromatic. Um, but I think it has to do with, um, I talked a little bit about that line between abstract and figurative representation. And there is something interesting psychologically about not presenting a clearly defined picture. And sort of, there's something about clear, crisp images that we like. And if visually we don't see it, we tend to project and fill in whatever's there. And there's also something narratively about obscuring a field of vision. So like a road in fog, you can't see what's beyond the fog. Um, and there's kind of this strong implied narrative of something's out there. Um, so it's sort of a visual tactic I use for narrative engagement in my work. Also, I think it looks pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Any 
with you, Natalie. Wasn't there a little bit of yellow in the smog picture? Yes. Okay. So even though I joke that I'm monochromatic, um, I mix all my own colors. Um, I never use the color straight out of the tube. And so I mix all my own blacks, I mix my grays. Um, and so there is a much more, there's a, a subtle richness of color to all of my work. But yes, the smog paintings it are quite sepia. Yeah. Really smog, mm -hmm. that way. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Ethan, for you, I had a comment to make with regards to the, to the pelicans that you made with the students mm -hmm. at the school. Don't you think you made some headway right there with those kids? Because then they went home and told their dad, you're spraying pesticides on the berries that we have to eat. So I, I think you've made a real footprint there in the schools. I, 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 I appreciate that. I, I, I shouldn't discount that. I, um, dialogue is the most productive thing that you can create you know, in, 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 in society. So to that extent, I feel good about it. And I, I, I think that part of what I'm trying to go, and this is part of the direction I want to go, is to tie those types of dialogues to real world uh, political, not uh, legislative choices that people are about to make. So say there's a ban, or a, a proposed ban for plastic bags in you know, a county. Time the artwork and the display of the public artwork around that decision point. Because um, as good as discourse is, unless it comes to a point, a focal point where people can actually act on it, then it, you know, sometimes it can become less, you know, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm focused on creating those political shifts in a way it, as, as an outcome. Because it's, it's, it's easy to become pessimistic about behavior change alone changing the world, even though we know it can. It's just you see enough examples day to day that counteract that. You know, people dump, toss some stuff out their window in the car on the freeway. You know, it just it, it gets old. And so I want to focus on the legislative space a little bit with the, with this type of project because um, there's and, and there's also a lot of work being done by NGOs all around the world to get us to focus on you know recycling and doing the right behaviors. But I just want to channel it. Is my goal. So working with high school students would help your channel it because they're going to become the voters right now. That's true. That's true. And I, 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 I um, they're deciding who they want to be. They have uh, a lot of skill. Uh, I was, you know, uh, it's it's an important time, and it's the type of group that I, and I've given talks and I've done workshops with lots of different age groups. It's it's the most fun group for me to work with. Is, is the reality. Because they, yeah, they, we can have a, a real back and forth and teach them skills. They teach me things, so it's it's a good age group. Lisa in the back. Oh, okay. um, I wanted to know if either of you have ever experimented with surrealist art rather than realism, mm -hmm. um, or have you found that realism is more effective in engaging the public when it comes to these issues? Um. Good question. I've been always pretty representational, um, which is not to say that I wouldn't ever be surrealist. Um, yeah, but I, I, I don't, I, that's just my personal style. I think that as long as you make an interesting piece of art and you can create a platform for conversation, um, there's no reason why. I mean, like that, that mural, the Pangea scene with the shark and the guy and the dragon wrestling um, is equally valid piece of artwork and is sort of surrealist. Um, so I think it just comes down to personal style and your artistic intention. Yeah. Um, I, I, as an artist, I have, it's funny, I've always been scared of making uh, figurative and representational work because when there's a right answer, all of a sudden you can be judged on it. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's abstract, there's a, you know, and there's no figure whatsoever, you know, it just, it can just make you feel. And, and so, it's nonetheless. I, I I I think that in the material that I am trying to talk about, I have to root it in some kind of you know the form of a whale's tail or something. And I make sculptures. I don't draw um, because that's just what I, I, you know, it's what I enjoy, and it's also what I have more experience with. So it's a comfort thing. Uh, I've made some weird art for sure, <laughs> but, but uh, <laughs> You know, the, the dance piece, you can see it online, Silent Spring. It's pretty out there. It's, it's not surrealist, but it's 
it's definitely conceptual. <laughs> Actually, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to put spot on you. Ethan was a semi-professional dancer growing up, <laughs> which somehow didn't Forgot come playing. up until now. But I'm <laughs> curious how. I mean, do you intend to do more movement-based art? Or that piece how was that inspired by my background. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I grew up from age four to thirteen in a dance studio, and uh, I had put all that in a closet because I would learn to surf and I was just like, screw this competitive, like get up on a stage and dance thing. Uh, and I just put all that away. I was done with it. I burned out for sure. Um, and surfing was just like, no, oh, like no rules, do whatever you want, express yourself. Um, I w not until I was in college, I like, took a hip hop class and like, you know, see if I still had it. And uh, <laughs> it was fun, but I didn't really reconnect to it. And um, after college, I decided, I saw this piece by Robert Rauschenberg, who's an artist that I think both like. Um, you guys know Robert Rauschenberg? No. He was, he, he was a fantastic uh, artist from the 60s and 70s, I guess, well, he lived for a long time, but biggest in the 60s and 70s. He was famous for uh, uh, picking stuff off the streets of New York and assembling it into these very interesting collage works. Also really pushed a lot of ground with uh, with printmaking and stuff. Uh, he had this really weird conceptual piece where he was on roller skates and made this like big wing like parachute thing and it was a huge hit. It was a huge you know success at, in the New York scene at the time. I found a video of it in the archives of SF MoMA. I thought it was really cool and it was called Pelican. It had nothing to do with Pelicans but it was cool and I love Robert Rauschenberg's work. So I was like I'm gonna do an homage to Robert Rauschenberg's work call it Pelican 2 and it had a uh, an environmental theme, the, the, the Rachel Carson narrative with it, but it was, uh, I made all the material from stuff I found in the streets, or all the costumes and stuff, so it felt like I was coming home a little bit doing a choreography piece because that was what I grew up with. Um, I, I, I would like to do more, yeah. Last question, Dakota. Uh, I was just wondering for your portraits of the shark, mm -hmm. where is this from your own mind, how you would envision them, or is no, this from a photo? No, great question. Or so with them? that little seal decoy that we have back behind the boat has a GoPro mounted on the bottom. Uh -huh, okay. So we have a lot of video documentation about how sharks approach their prey. Um, and then we also have a GoPro on a pole. It's very funny. We have these incredibly high-tech tags that we put on sharks, but the way that we put them on the sharks is very janky and low tech. <laughs> so we lure them to the boat with carpet, and then we have a GoPro and a pole that we stick over the side, and so we collect footage of them that way as well. And then we also take topside photos. But so you're painting from photographs. So I'm painting from video and photographs. You're not like you're dingy with your. Yeah, I'm not like this is what Gigi looks like. Playing water. Yeah. Um, the t tagging process. You basically harpoon them. Yeah, we stick the yep. tag into the yeah. Or like that camera tag, so that orange thing in the video that he was trying to put on, that tag is probably $10,000. But that clamp that we're putting on with Shark, someone went to Home Depot and gerrymandered that thing. And so it's amazing in science how some of the technology, we put all of our assets into this highly complex and expensive technology, and then a lot of it is just inventing it as you go. There's room for creativity. There's a lot of room for creativity, exactly. <laughs> Problem solving. We once intubated a sperm whale with a garden hose and fed it Pedialyte from a, an oil change funnel. Are, so are you being serious right Yeah. Um, okay, so I have one, one, one last question um, for you guys. Just So you, you mentioned that some of the, the bigger things you've just finished recently. I'm, I'm just curious what kind of artistic or else scientific endeavors are on the near horizon for both of you. Oh, dear. Good question. <laughs> You don't have to have an answer. No, you can no, say no, you're no. still figuring um, it out. So I am in the process of figuring out whether I want to go back to graduate school and do a PhD, um, which will obviously be a big step towards um, my scientific career. So I'm figuring that out. We had an existential conversation at dinner, so Dan knows about that. But um, I actually really was meant more about art. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You done painting whales? Is it you know, limpets next? Yeah, um, actually, I'm having a show next month um, at a gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and this is sort of a big transition. But um, I made very large paintings um, from historical photos from the Holocaust. Oh. So this is I, I went full dark. Um, <laughs> 
but this is kind of a long story how i arrived at these paintings, but this is my first attempt at engaging with a social and political narrative. and i had a woman in my studio four or five years ago who at the same time i was making those road paintings, i made railroad track paintings, and a woman broke down in front of one of my large railroad paintings because her grandmother had died at auschwitz. and so it was the first time i had someone have that strong and violent of a reaction to one of my paintings, and it made me think about how i could be like with, like i talked about with engaging with environmental narratives, how i could engage with the social and historical narrative. and so i started looking at lots of historical photos from the Holocaust and these spaces and found that I was being haunted by these seemingly, I mean, yes, it's a creepy dark room, but there's nothing inherently disturbing about an empty concrete room. And yet, if you go and you visit some of these places, I'm not a particularly religious person, but you can really feel something of what has happened in that space. And so I wanted to see if in a painting I could create an empathic connection with this very dark period of history and make people think um, deeply introspectively about um, how these kinds of atrocities have occurred and um, be more socially and politically aware. So that's, in a nutshell, that's the show I'm having. Um, I will be giving an artist talk if anyone is interested, um, which we will be broadcasting on the internet um, with some community leaders and an art critic about the role of political art. So, yeah. Trying to get funding for Countercurrent to uh, <laughs> take on bigger projects. We're going to do the workshops either way. They're, you know, I'll volunteer my time. But, uh, the, but I want to make bigger work. Um, I want to find opportunities to rise to political slash legislative moments. Maybe the offshore uh, drilling. Uh, survey period. There's been a lot of protests recently around that. Uh, the Trump administration is opening up the examination of uh, U.S. national waters to uh, see if they want to, it's like we've been through this a million times, but they want to see if uh, if they're going to, if they can drill them in the uh, 41 platforms off of, they're planning like 41 platforms off of California's coast. He knows more about that for sure. I just know that one part is like that's Something that's been proposed or thought of or planned or it's tossed around. Mm -hmm. It's opening up a lot of old wounds. That I, I grew up in the National Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which basically exists to prevent uh, offshore oil exploration. Uh, and so it's there's a there's a moment there that we're maybe hoping maybe we'll tap into. Um, I make a lot of work with rope these days, and uh, interestingly enough. Uh, all the fishermen in my area use the same kind of color room, so I'm kind of getting bored with that color palette. Uh, <laughs> so I need to, and also I'm reclaiming it directly from the fishermen, like uh, this is material that hasn't been found on the beach, so I, I actually want to raise, I think I can raise more awareness by getting the material off the beach and making pieces from that. It's more of a complete story. Um, so I'm maybe uh, trying to set up a small studio in Hawaii and making you know, material from the beaches there. Uh, kind of like the wave ones that you were seeing. So that's a goal. Cool. Well, thank you both. Thank you guys for your questions for being here. Thank you guys for your time.